Hi everyone and, and thanks for joining us for our panel today. I'm Sam Hutchinson, a fund finance partner at Cadwallader in London and I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel where we'll be talking about the various types of alternative liquidity solutions available to private markets man managers. Each of the institutions represented today on this panel have had a really meaningful impact on the development and evolution of the fund finance market and I'm delighted they've agreed to join me today. If you do have questions for the panellists, there's a function on your screen allowing you to raise them and we'll absolutely try and fit them in at the end of the session. But you can, of course, reach out to any of us afterwards with any follow up questions. But let me start by introducing the panel. Over to you, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Foster. I'm a partner in uh, the New York offices of Cadwallader. I specialize in financing and derivatives for investment funds. Uh, that covers a range of investment funds from hedge funds to fund of funds, um, secondaries funds, private equity funds, and registered investment companies. A uh, large part of my practice focuses on highly structured asset-based and hybrid solutions for private equity primary and secondaries funds. Thank you, Brian. Rich. All right. My name is Rich Galashevsky. I'm an, I'm an investment director with 17 Capital. We are a investment firm that is that is dedicated to and that and that really pioneered the market for portfolio financing for successful private equity managers. We've raised five billion of capital. We've we've executed sixty transactions since two thousand and eight. We invest both through preferred equity and through NAV based loans, and we are based between London and New York. Thanks, Rich. Matt? Yep, uh, Matthew Holden. Uh, I'm a member of the Private Capital Advisor Group here at Lazard or, or PCA. Um, so the PCA group at Lazard for some backgrounds has got two limbs, private capital raising where we advise GPs on fundraising and private capital solutions where we specialize in advising both general partners and limited partners on secondary transactions. I sit in the secondaries part of the group, uh, have been part of the team now for around about two and a half years. And then prior to that, spent five years in the fund level financing team at Lloyds Bank with a focus on secondaries and private credit. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, James. Thank you, Sam. So I'm James Rock Pering, Head of Fund Finance Advisory at Intertrust. We advise across um, private equity, debt funds, infrastructure funds, uh, and real estate funds. Um, across subscription line facilities and nav lines. Uh, we, we advise both in the US and the UK at the moment, we're based here in, uh, in London. Uh, previous to that, um, I was at the Lloyd's Fund Finance team um, and, and before that about 10, 15 years experience in restructuring and uh, leverage finance. Thanks James and, and last but certainly not least Ian. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, I'm Ian Visa from Investec Bank. Uh, we're a, a fund solution specialist providing a liquidity solutions to funds and fund managers and um, really, um, you know, focusing on the entire life cycle of a fund so and, and risk spectrum. So from subscription lines to uh, hybrid facilities and NAV solutions um, with, from more from a debt angle. Great, thanks Ian. So let, let me start by setting the scene for this panel. Um, 2019 was another record year for the private markets. Uh, we saw sponsors raise $315 billion, which is the highest single year fundraise in recent years. And we were also sitting on around $5 trillion of dry powder. And then we hit March. Um, fundraising mostly halted, uh, M&A activity dried up. Portfolio companies began hitting cash crunches. Uh, we saw dislocation in the markets, which created some opportunities. Uh, we saw some initial concerns around investor liquidity, which thankfully abated um, pretty quickly. And we saw certain lending institutions putting a pause on or, or restricting their lending activity. And all of this gave rise to a really urgent need for liquidity for many fund managers. Uh, but against this backdrop, we were actually in a very different position to the one we were in going into the previous crisis, the, the GFC. Firstly, we had $5 trillion of, of dry powder ready to be invested. We had new technologies and products which had emerged, for example, in the secondaries market, including GP-led solutions. We had preferred equity emerge 
as effectively a standalone subset of the secondaries market. Um, some lending institutions, rather than putting the brakes on, were actually ready to accelerate uh, seeing the opportunities in the market that the dislocations presented. And we also had advisors in the fund finance market for the first time able to advise on the various types of products available in the fund finance market. So turning to my panelists, each of you represent a, a different segment of this market. And I'd like to talk with you about your experience during the crisis. Um, what, what demand did you see for your product or offering? How did this change during the COVID period? Have you seen any differences in the usage of your product? Um, and maybe for the benefit of our listeners who might not be that familiar with your products, if you could maybe start by giving a, a brief explanation um, of the product or, the, or, or your offering. Uh, maybe let me go to Rich first on the preferred equity side. Sure. Thanks, Sam. So, so from a scene setting perspective, as I as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we 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 really pioneered the market for for portfolio financing through preferred equity, and we and 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 we we do that in in multiple ways and for multiple reasons. We work with institutional investors. We work with GPs at the portfolio level. We also work with 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 GP teams and management companies. The real key tenant to our um, to our finance and to our investment strategy is is we are we are working with a portfolio and we are working with successful private equity managers. Um, what have we really seen change? Uh, we had a really strong pipeline coming into COVID. Um, COVID was was an accelerant for for deal flow, but has but has not been the only theme this year. What we continue to see are are investors use our capital and and use our solutions, be it preferred equity or or NAV loans, for more and more reasons. There's there's more and more good case studies of 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 where preferred equity works. Um, to give you an example of a of a transaction that we that we made that what that that was more pandemic driven we worked with a with a with a mid-market buyout firm uh in 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 one of their older investment vehicles it was a fully called fund they had a time sensitive need for capital to repurchase the debt at a at a discount for one of their underlying portfolio companies so 17 capital made a made a preferred equity investment at a at a level below the fund but above the portfolio companies uh, that was really a win-win for for ourselves for the GP and for their investors um, I, I I think the broader theme this year has been it has been increased adoption of portfolio finance by successful and well-regarded groups. Um, we would hear over the years that I understand what you do. I think it's interesting, but we're more old fashioned or we're more conservative. That's really going away. I think our, our um, to, to draw a parallel to maybe Matt's business, um, we are at a place now that the GP led secondaries market was maybe four or five years ago where portfolio finance is really being viewed as a, as a tool in the toolkit. There are a lot of reasons to, to use it. It is, it, is, it, is, it is now much more opportunistic than it is a special situation. Great, Th thank you, Rich. And, and then I guess nicely leading on to you, Matt, on the secondary side, uh, and in particular on the, on the GP-led solutions, have you seen those during the, the pandemic period? Yeah, no, I think the, the panel topic today is, is a really interesting one, alternative liquidity solutions. It's, it's pretty broad. It covers preferred equity and the instruments that, that Rich was describing. Uh, and I think it also encapsulates a lot of the activity that we are seeing ourselves in the GP-led um, secondaries market at the moment. So um, we at Lazar, we spend the majority of our time advising GPs or majority of our time in secondaries, sorry, advising GPs on GP-led transactions. 
These all typically include a common goal, and that common goal is to create liquidity for investors um, through from either one or multiple portfolio companies. Um, so GP-led secondaries, for those who don't know, uh, they can take a variety of different forms, but most typically they'll involve the transferring of an asset or a portfolio of assets out of a fund uh, to a new vehicle that's capitalized by secondary investors. In doing so, you provide a liquidity option uh, to the investors in the selling fund at a competitive secondary market valuation. Um, investors that want to sell, they can sell at that valuation, but investors that want to stay with the GP uh, and with the asset or portfolio of assets can reinvest into the new vehicle, uh, which will then typically hold the company for another, another three to five years. Um, like the preferred equity market, like the NAV financing market, we have really certainly post summer seen unprecedented levels of activity in our market. Um, just to maybe set the scene for the scale of the market. Um, and we'll, I guess we'll go into greater detail on this later. Um, GP led volumes, I think in recent years have typically formed around about a third of the total secondary market. And for context, that total secondary market last year was around about $85 billion uh, in volumes. We expect the GP led market. And again, for, I guess, reasons we may be touched upon in a bit, we expect the GP led market to form around about 40 to 50% um, of volumes. Um, so we've been incredibly busy. We're excited about the growth of the market and yeah, looking forward to talking about it a bit more today. Great, thank you, Matt. And then Ian, can we get your take on the NAV facility side? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of kind of parallels or um, you know, similar features. I think the first thing that's changed was that um, in the past, Rich and I probably, we, we were knocking on doors, uh, you know, introducing certain concepts to clients. And um, I think during the COVID crisis, we had a lot of GPs knocking on our doors, wanting to explore and really understand and, and be educated on, on the alternative solutions, whether it's more of a NAV based debt solution or a preferred equity solution. But what we also found very interesting is who was driving those discussions. It, it was not only GPs, it was also LPs. LPs working very closely with their GPs, uh, exploring various solutions, and often dictating in one way which solution, solution to, to choose. So we thought, you know, found that is really interesting. I think on the NAV-based solutions, I think what, what really stood out is there was a lot of discussions, especially in the beginning as people were worried about how certain portfolios would perform. And that is what we refer to as kind of more protection capital. I think the more interesting side is where these facilities actually have been used is more on the uh, accretive side and M&A side of things as the, the, the V shape kind of happened. And, you know, maybe there was a bit of a, uh, a, a overreaction in the beginning and things certainly calmed down. It's really now where you have mature funds, private equity funds wanting to do that additional bolt on that additional M&A acquisition and, and using these facilities. Maybe just to set the scene further, I think to, to Matt's point is I think where we've been um, you know, fortunate is that we play in both that NAV space, but also on the GP led space. And certainly over the last eight weeks, I would say um, a theme, a certain secondary funds would, that would not normally use uh, some form of leverage in a, in a GP led deal is certainly exploring or have uh, you know commenced using that. So there's been a migration to Richard's earlier point. I think people have so, certainly started adopting uh, more interesting solutions in the market. Great, thank you, Ian. Um, James, coming to you on the, the advisor side, I guess from where you're standing, you you have visibility across the entire market and see you know which GPs are using which type of products. Um, how has what's been your experience in terms of what you've seen over the past uh, seven months or so? Yeah, sure. So you know, you're right. I mean, I get I basically have a view across all strategies across private markets, right? Um, across products and obviously across all whether it be a bank lender or fund lender. So, I mean, without repeating uh, what, what each of the panelists have said, I mean, essentially, you know, what, yeah, there has been a change, in, a step change in the use of products. And I'll touch on, I know we're talking about NAV, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention Subline in this instance here as well. And, and everyone knows Subline is, or who doesn't know is Subline is subscription line facilities are a working capital tool um, used by funds to bridge capital calls. But, but essentially, what's sort of been the catalyst for, um, you know, change in products in fund finance has been, you know, the stress on financial markets, which is obviously 
caused uh, you know GPs to focus on liquidity, right? So when you look at a fund through its cycle, right from the beginning of the you know of the, the outset through its investment period to end of life, um, yeah, the, the there's there was a a sparked remarked increase in the use of products, obviously on the subscription line side, um, you know, to affect. Um, you know, to create liquidity, obviously there were increased draws, there was urgency to put facilities in place to make sure you got the liquidity. But then, um, you know, obviously from a portfolio perspective, that's where the needs obviously start occurring. And therefore, you know, at the asset level, lines will be drawn down there. But that's when obviously, um, you know, uh, Ian has touched on, Matt's touched on it, and, 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 and Rich has, there's been a, 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 a real marked increase in the use of NAV facilities, which were pre-COVID, we're, we're, we're in the fall, we're being discussed, but obviously with the signs of the potential downturn, they were, they were becoming popular, but the, but COVID, what it's done is it's further exacerbated, exacerbated those conversations. So, so yes, product is more in demand, um, but what we'll do is we'll come on to more, you know, the, the change in terms and also the lending landscape a bit further on in the, uh, in the discussions. Great. Th thank you, James. And then, uh, Brian, over to you. It's been a pretty busy time for us on the legal side, right? It has. It has. Um, in terms of what we saw, you know, I, I think it's similar. Uh, in March, we saw a very sharp change in the mix of deals that were coming across. Uh, in 2019, the secondaries market had been very active. Uh, I was looking very active in, in Q1 of 2020. Uh, when we hit March, we saw that market go very quiet. Um, you know, as it was widely reported in the media, secondaries funds were out successfully, su successfully raising enormous amounts of capital, I think continued to, to put sublines in place, uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, nav, nav lines, secondaries lines where they were pledging assets, uh, they put a pause on that in, in the early months of, of COVID. And we're starting to see a bounce back in that activity in the past few months, which is good. Um, interestingly, there was also a burst of financing deals in March and April for, for hedge funds and funds of hedge funds as those funds look to raise capital uh, to take advantage of dislocations in both the public and the private markets. Uh, you continue to see more and more hedge funds invest in private assets and uh, you know, look and act more like private equity funds. Um, you know, and the fact that those funds don't typically have committed but uncalled capital from investors it made sense that they were you know, getting that financing from, from traditional lines. Uh, but, but mostly what we saw you know, starting in March was just a, there was an explosion in the use of NAV lines for private equity funds. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk today quite a bit, I think, about you know, why the need for those lines increase. But I think an important part of the picture is on the other side, you had new entrants on the lender side. Um, whereas in the past, a lot of NAV lending was focused with specialty, you know, private lenders or bank lenders with expertise in a specific sector. Um, we, you know, we saw a number of larger bank lenders enter the market um, and, and be able to start providing those facilities. And you know, I think the shift was that a lot of them have that expertise in terms of they've been underwriting companies on corporate loans for some time. They've been doing leveraged finance, so. They already had the, the ability to, to evaluate companies and taking that expertise and shifting it to a fund level loan where they were looking at uh, portfolios of companies and, and underwriting the portfolio really opened up a lot of, lot of opportunity on the lender side. Thanks, Brian. Um, I, I wanna drill down now a little bit more into PREF and, and NAV solutions for a moment. It seemed to me over the summer, uh, as Brian alluded to just now that there wasn't a day that went by without there being some article around uh, NAV or, or PREF solutions in the in the private equity press. And I really think the last uh, seven, eight months have, have really brought these products into the into the spotlight. Obviously, these aren't new products and we've all been very familiar with them for, for a very long time now, but they really did seem to get uh, pushed into the spotlight as a result of, I guess, the, the, the real urgent liquidity needs that, that GPs had. And I want to... Um, ask Ian and uh, Rich in particular about their perception or, or their perception of GP's perceptions and investors' perceptions of these types of products um, and whether that has changed as a result of the pandemic. Certainly my own perception is that this period has really allowed market participants to see the benefits and, and how valuable and flexible these products um, can be. I'd be interested to also understand whether you have a sense of why GPs are, are choosing one of those products over the other and, and whether there are any 
interesting observations in terms of use of those products um, in, in Europe versus the US. Maybe if I come to you first, Ian. I think the first thing is, and this is our experience, we, we've seen um, different, uh, well, first of all, GPs educating themselves on both products. Uh, and, you know, each product has uh, has a, a certain business case and merit to it, you know, preferred equity often being associated with being more flexible, uh, a debt solution, better price, maybe more rigid in terms of covenants. And that's the perception out there. I think two things that, that we've noticed is, first of all, often LPs in different geographic areas take a different view. And, and, and one of our experiences has been where North American LPs potentially prefer more uh, you know, or put a premium on flexibility. And when you've got two sets of LPs on an L pack, we've seen in some instances where it's, you know, a more um, a North American um, strong LP base, uh, you know, a preferred equity solution may be something that they're more familiar with or something that they but more keen to explore given the flexibility as opposed to a European investor base, maybe more cost conscious, more inherently conservative. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I know I'd be interested to hear Rich's view, but we've actually seen a bit of a muddying of the water or, you know, where these two product sets are actually moving very close together that when you look at a certain solution, you have to look very carefully, is it a debt solution or is it a preferred equity solution? I think I would agree to, you know, with what Brian has said, I think there are more participants. But that being said, we've also seen interesting deals, which raises a few eyebrows and questions. And, you know, it would be interesting to see whether or not all these participants remain uh, in the long run. So a few observations from our side, Richard, be, be, be very interested hearing your views. Yeah, no, that's super interesting, Ian. And really agree with with um with uh with everything you said on 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 kind of one product versus the other we we really view them as one set of solutions uh i can't tell you the number of conversations that begin that where we are speaking about preferred equity and we end up down the path on an nav loan or vice versa um but it's 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 really this one theme of of portfolio finance and, and what 17 Capital wants to understand early, what are the, what are the hot button items that, that really matter to a counterparty? Is it the lowest cost of capital? Is it the most flexibility? Are there certain documentation issues? Uh, so we, we do a lot of work early on with counterparties and their, and their legal counsel and, and, and advisors on, 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 on understanding what are the structuring requirements? What are the goals and objectives? That uh, that allows most most groups to end up to end up self-selecting one or the other, uh, a preferred equity or a or a credit solution. Um, I think we have a we have a real benefit that we can offer both. We have we have pools of capital that are set up to offer each. Um, so we so there are uh, there are that many more conversations where we. Um, where we can be, uh, where we can be relevant and be a a a value add. What I think that this year has seen is a is really the the proliferation of the of the NAV loan. I think there were far more articles written about it before there were uh, there were a lot of transactions done. It's been a it's 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 been a very large year um, be, be, between ourselves and Ian and others who have. Who have closed some really interesting transactions, that that only increases more the availability and deliverability of this um, of this uh, 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 of this finance. What I would say to uh, potential GPs that are that are considering using it is keep an open mind. Um, you may think you want a loan, but what might work better is 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 preferred equity, um, so I think it's I think it's I think it's uh, important that we help people understand what are the what are the actual uh, elements of each. Um, I would just add as as a closing remark uh, that you know we've spoken about Rich and I you know on the banking side and on the preferred equity side we've also seen secondary funds you know tr um, trying to offer one of these solutions as well and you know the relevance so you you you've had 
preferred equity specialists, banking specialists, you know, maybe offering both, but you've also seen, you know, other uh, participants in the market, you know, uh, coming into this uh, area. So that's also been quite an interesting development. Yeah, absolutely. And Anna, I think for me, it's, it's really uh, incredible to see how the, I guess, the asset backed side of the fund finance market has evolved um, and developed so quickly. I, I, I totally agree that there has been a, a massive uptick in interest in both NAV and PREF solutions. But I think what's been as interesting is, you know, if you, if you look back to pre-COVID, the, the various products that were on offer, and there did seem to be a, a reasonably clear demarcation between NAV lines on the one side and preferred equity solutions on the other. And, and now what we see in the market, I think this is probably a product of or at least in part a product of the fact that we're getting some very large GPs interested in these lines now is that they you know they want to see something in the middle you know something sitting sitting in the middle of a NAV and a PREF solution and pretty much in the market now every price point in between a NAV and a PREF someone is there providing it and we're also seeing a lot of institutional capital um, as you say Ian providing this um, which has represented some really interesting uh, challenges and, and, and structures for us to sort of grapple with, which takes me nicely over to you, Brian, in terms of we know that you've um, you've obviously spent a lot of time uh, over the past eight months or so structuring these types of transactions from a, a legal perspective. Have there been any particular challenges um, that have been thrown up by these particular structures? Yes, yeah, Sam. So it's been interesting. I, I think, as others have indicated, there's been a proliferation of highly structured deals. Uh, that, that we've seen getting done since March. Uh, there, there's a number of gating issues that arise, particularly on the, the NAV transactions, which I think are the juiciest from a, a legal and structuring perspective. The, the first issue is the typical issue of whether the, the funds LPA even permits a NAV financing. Uh, you know, sometimes what you see is the, the LPA doesn't doesn't contemplate that because funds are used to relying on subscription lines and acquisition finance. And so there's not always a clear path to, to put that sort of facility in place. Uh, we've seen some funds as a result of that go back to their investors to seek consent to enter into a, such, a, such a financing. And the, the reaction on that has been, has been mixed. Uh, there's been disagreements among investors as to you know, whether to do that financing to the ex extend the life of a particular investment um, that was nearing a realization. There are disagreements as to whether the best way to finance it is through additional equity contributions versus NAV. Um, you know, so there's been robust discussion around that, uh, and we've, you know, we've seen a number of structured solutions floated to deal with that, including uh, you know things like shifting investors around to new feeder funds and moving the financing up to a feeder fund level, you know, to provide the debt financing to the investors that they wanted and allow other investors to contribute equity, um, you know, th things like that. Um, in addition to that, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, structuring solutions like setting up the financing at a subsidiary level and having the fund enter into an equity commitment letter in order to support the subsidiary financing. Um, so that's another structuring solution we've seen for that. The, the second issue we come up against a lot is whether the NAV financing really works in the context of the um, underlying investments. So a lot of funds have complex, multi-layered, multi-jurisdictional uh, investment structures where at the bottom you'll have a mix of you know, majority and minority stakes in operating companies. And the shareholder agreements governing those investments may restrict or prohibit pledges. Uh, they may restrict or prohibit transfers. Uh, so diligence is really critical to, to dive into those structures and figure out, you know, where prohibitions lie, where consents are required, uh, you know, to make sure both from the fund perspective and from the lender perspective that, that you're complying with all of those requirements. Um, a lot of the portfolio companies obviously have their own credit facilities, so you have to check, uh, you know, whether the NAV financing is going to violate the, the portco level financings. Do they have change of control provisions and, and those sorts of issues that they need to be accommodated for. Um, and so the, the, the result of that is sometimes with the portfolio, you identify some assets that just can't be pledged or that you know, only proceeds of the assets can be pledged. Uh, sometimes you identify jurisdictional issues in terms of the holding structure uh, that, that need to be addressed. 
and, and so sometimes you have a mix of full security over a portion of the uh, of the assets and and you know less than full security over the remainder. Um, and then the, the last thing we come across a lot is that you, you know you, these funds invest in a lot of companies in regulated industries. So you have to be mindful of you know whether you're taking a pledge over. Uh, the type of company where e either the pledge or that transfer of ownership, if they're ever foreclosure, you know, requires regulatory approval or other types of approvals. So you see stuff like banks, broker dealers, gaming companies, investment advisors, professional sports franchises, you, you come across some interesting issues. And so there's a, a lot of upfront work to identify all of that, digest it and make sure everybody's comfortable that the, the structure complies with what it needs to comply with. I think we've, we've just temporarily lost Sam. So should, should I should I give my view on um, on the lending landscape, um, how it's changed during COVID, uh, what terms we've seen, and, and maybe change in appetite, Brian? So yes, yeah, so look. As I said, I have a view quite across um, you know lenders across funds, but I mean effectively. When you look at the the lending landscape, one of the things I've noticed, whether you're talking about subscription lines or, or NAV, is that um, you know the 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 teams, whether it be in a bank or funds, have been exceptionally busy. So you know, reduced bandwidth is one of them. Um, you when you look across the the NAV space, and you could equally apply it to um, you can equally apply this to subscription lines. You know, there's been a, a effectively a COVID premium, right? Um, obviously, a much smaller premium on subscription lines versus, um, you know, just by by the fact that now pricing is higher. There's 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 some increased pricing on that side. So, also banks, um, you know, looking at and potentially then is looking at reduction in hold levels and a focus on you know more established names. Um, so for smaller funds or who haven't been uh, had the same track record. It's probably been a, a, a bit more difficult uh, to raise uh, these type of facilities in the last couple of months. Um, on, specifically on, on NAV, I suppose when you look at it, when you break it down between the, what I would say is more diversified NAV portfolios versus more concentrated NAV. So the more diversified NAV, NAV is more the, the more banks um, in the space, as, as Ian, will, Ian will know. Um, and, you know, what's really happened there is, is that just like uh, you know, if you if you if you flick it around to the credit departments of banks, where they're looking at a subline or even looking at a at NAV, they're going to be they're going to be trading carefully and they're going to be focusing much more on the portfolio now on performance, right? Uh, due to all of issue around liquidity. So, uh, as a result, you've probably got some more conservatism in terms of, especially on say a diversified portfolio, um, in 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 the LTV levels that you're going to um, lend against that element of NAV, um, and. And also probably around covenants, because obviously the product here is, um, you know, whilst you have covenant defaults at certain, you could have a covenant default at a, at a asset level financing when you're doing, um, you know, portfolio financing, stroke now financing, you have, if you have a trigger or financial default, uh, sorry, a financial covenant breach, then obviously the lender could effectively take the key. So, so what you've got is a big rig focus on uh, triggers um, at certain levels of um, of, of breaches, which would mean a staged uh, process whereby a portfolio would have to have a serious reduction in, in, in LTVs before it got to the worst case where, um, you know, the lender would really have to step in, which is really a last resort. Um, you know, and then the other side, which is, which, um, you know, Rich touched upon as well is, there's been a, you know, a much more, um, many more lenders coming into the more concentrated NAV uh, space which is obviously where you've, you know, if you've got probably higher LTVs, maybe more diversified, um, you know, portfolio companies will be sometimes even one. Um, and obviously a commensurate increase in pricing versus the diversified NAV lending from the bank side. So, um, you know, seeing that, um, what else? And, and probably actually, you know, when you look at through the life cycle of a fund, um, you, you, you're seeing, I'm seeing more use of hybrids where you're starting off with a uh, one facility which looks up at the uh, the uncalled capital, uh, your subscription line, but then as you move through the investment period, your uncalled capital is coming down and you've, you, you're creating more NAV. Um, so you start off with one facility which uh, which hopefully the pricing reflects that, that blended uh, 
that blended um, asset base or, or security base. Um, and that's probably about it. Thanks, James, and, and apologies for, for dropping off there, everyone. M moral of the story is don't move to a farm in the middle of nowhere, which has no reception just before a pandemic hits and you've got to work full time from there. Uh, but thank you for carrying me, Brian. Um, Matt, coming to you, um, uh, moving to GP Labs in particular as a, as a means of obtaining liquidity. You mentioned earlier that these now represent a significant proportion of the market. We saw them represent a third last year. And, and as you say, it looks like they, they're going to represent a, an even higher percentage, possibly even a half of um, total transaction volume in the secondaries market. And today really seems like the perfect environment for these types of products to prosper as GPs need to hold assets for longer and need additional capital. Um, how has, I, I guess, the last eight months been in terms of what you've seen in the market in the secondaries? on the secondary side, in particular on the GP-led side, Matt, in terms of the types of deals that you're seeing. Yeah, and I agree with everything you said. And yeah, the, the last eight months, I mean, we've been seeing uh, an extremely wide range of sponsors exploring our, our market, the GP-led market. And I think seeing higher quality assets than we've you know potentially ever seen before. I think you know a few drivers I would point to here, one of which you know, it's one of the key drives that spawned the GP market um, what, less than a decade ago still, and still remains key today. And that is, you know, the ability for sponsors to use the GP market to extend investments on winning and trophy portfolio companies whilst still providing that liquidity option um, you know, to those investors that want it. I think you know, every sponsor, um, you know, if you, you you ask them, has probably got that one, those one or two portfolio companies from their history that, you know, they would have loved to have kept hold of, but because of the life of their funds, they had to exit. Um, you know, the GP market solves for that. So that's still key. I think, secondly, I think there's, uh, I guess, a snowballing effect. And I think the, you know, the increasing use of the GP led market by, by blue chip sponsors. I mean, we, at Lazard have been lucky enough over the past 12 months. We've worked with Aries, we've worked with Pamira, we've worked with Warburg on you know, very successful high profile GP led transactions. Um, these are all highly regarded sponsors. And the fact that groups like them are, have been using our market increasingly has really put the technology, I think, on the radar of, of all sponsors, um, you know, to the extent that it wasn't there already. Uh, and maybe thirdly, a more maybe a slightly more COVID relevant point. Um, you know, COVID-19 has changed value creation plans for, for sponsors uh, and their companies um, oftentimes and created you know, new opportunities sometimes for value creation. These were new opportunities that potentially weren't contemplated you know, on day one and might need more time and or capital to execute. You know, more time or capital that may be present within the, the fund structure. Again, the GP led market is being used to, to solve for that potential issue. Um, on COVID-19, maybe a couple of themes I would, I would point to, I think you know, right now, diverse portfolios. So a diverse portfolio in a GP led transaction is maybe a little bit tougher to come across for secondary investors, um, you know, potentially just because of how rare it is at the moment to find a portfolio or a mature portfolio even of, you know, 10 plus companies where you know, most slash all of them you know, are doing really quite well during COVID and where the sponsor wants to hang on to them for another three to five years. You know, you're far more likely to come across transactions where you know, we've, you've got one to four highly COVID resilient companies that the sponsor you know, can provide that clear visibility um, to 2X plus forward returns and where they're also looking to continue managing those assets for you know, the medium term, but equally looking to provide that liquidity option to their LPs. So maybe just some numbers um, to conclude. I mean, 2018 to 2019, um, single asset um, GP leds, uh, they were already growing. I mean, from we went from 15% of the, the fund recapitalization market to 35%. Um, so it's not a new phenomenon, phenomenon even. Uh, by any stretch, um, but it's been accelerated by COVID. So you know, we haven't got the data yet. We're still compiling it, but based upon you know the data that we're gathering and the feedback we're getting from investors in the market, single asset deals um, at the moment are representing you know potentially up to half of the GP led deal volume that's being brought to market. 
Um, so, you know, maybe just to conclude and recap, I mean, we've touched upon, I guess, or I've tried to touch upon anyway, what we're seeing in the market, you know, why we're seeing what we're seeing, how COVID um, was impacting the market. And I, I hope that's kind of been, been helpful and yeah, looking forward to answering any Q&A if we've got time for it. That's brilliant, Matt. Thank you. Um, so we, we actually only have five minutes left. Um, I knew this was going to be a challenge to um, to try and cover all of your areas within 45 minutes, but it's been extremely interesting. I'm going to finish with um, a question. I'm going to challenge you to answer it in, in one minute. So um, the, the question is, um, given the variation across each of the products that we've been discussing today, do you see any scope for any new products coming to market? And um, what are your expectations in terms of how the rest of this year and, and 2021 will pan out? I know it's super unfair of me to only give you a minute to answer that question, but um, maybe I can go to Ian first. Um, I would call it evolution. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, product sets moving closer together and, uh, you know, a really kind of, you know, a pick and mix scenario where you're going to bolt on and use a specific product for a specific situation and tweak it to look like a different one. But uh, I think I'd agree with what was said earlier and certainly in Vesex philosophy is you can't, you know, put something down someone's mouth. It has to work for a specific situation. So I think you're going to use the product sets and make sure that the solution is tailored made. Uh, I don't think there's going to be new products, more evolution of existing products. Great, thank you, Rich. Sure. So, um, similar response to Ian. We're going to we're going to continue to 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 apply these solutions, which are pretty simple financial concepts, onto more and more situations. Um, two that are that are of that are of real interest in uh, and action at Seventeen Capital are 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 putting senior financing into GP led transactions. As well as um, as as to use our is to is using our, our financing tools to to help funds and GPs up at the management company for for growth capital needs. Thank you, Rich. Um, Matt. Um, so I'd, I'd say to the extent you know. One of the biggest challenges facing our market at the moment is probably just its ability to meet all of the high quality demand that's coming from sponsors for it. I think you know, we are seeing the market respond to this though. Um, you know, we're seeing some buy side firms now raising dedicated GP led funds, others looking to maybe amend concentration limits or asset concentration limits in their LPAs um, you know, to allow them to take a slightly more flexible approach just to to meet and take advantage of all this, all the high quality deal flow that I was referencing and that we're currently seeing in the market. Thank you, Matt. Um, James. Yeah, so just quick, I, what I would say is, I mentioned hybrids earlier, so I think there's a slight convergence. There will be a convergence in uh, between fund finance and leverage finance in terms of the products that you can use there because you're, you're talking about a portfolio versus uh, individual assets. Um, I would say, yeah, or, uh, you know, quite quickly, I would say that, 2020, there's a pause in fundraising. And if you look at, I think the latest days we came on pre it's, it's there will be a slight drop off this year. But then if you're looking at uh, across all strategies, ex ex expect, I mean, ex ex especially private equity, um, you know, they're talking about it from 2020 to 2025, um, you know, a, a, a doubling in, in, in fundraising. So if you look at it from an alternate, from a NAV perspective, I think there was 680 million dollars of NAV uh, available from vintages from 2010 to 2016. So if you overlay increased fundraising, uh, so if you, if you take the 616, assuming 10 to 15 percent comes to market, you've got 100 billion of of NAV there. Um, if you keep overlaying increased fundraising, which which should happen in 2021, 22, etc., then you're overlaying that, you're creating more opportunities to do um, do NAV deals. Great, thank you, James and, and Brian. Lastly, over to you. We've we've got one minute left. Yeah, just to uh, echo what everyone else says, I think a couple of potential financing structures to keep an eye on are, um, you know, using craft shares as collateral for financings. I think there's been a bit of that this year. I could see some more of that happening. Um, the other thing to keep an eye on every year, and I've been saying this for three, four years, and the, the explosion hasn't happened yet, but collateralized fund obligations. Uh, Cadwallader worked on one for a top tier um, you know, secondary sponsor 
earlier this year. I think there's been another one since. Um, you know, so that's a simple securitization where you have maybe a couple of debt tranches and equity tranche typically rated and sold into insurance company or institutional money networks. So uh, something to keep an eye on again this year. I totally agree with that, Brian, and that would be my prediction as well, is, is seeing interesting structures to get institutional capital into our markets. Um, we're out of time, so I want to say a massive thank you to each of you for joining. It's been a really, really interesting and really topical conversation. Um, I, I wish we'd had longer, but thank you very much, and I hope you get to enjoy a well-deserved beer or glass of wine. Thanks, everyone.